<clears throat> well, again, let's attempt to get a running start on this chapter. Paul has shown us uh, in the first chapter why the Gentiles, and that would be the, the nations, the, the non-Jews, the people of this world, would include us, okay? Why we were without excuse even when we didn't have God's Word. And the reason is we knew that God existed through what He's made. We knew what God was like. We knew from our consciences what God required of us. But we suppressed that knowledge. We essentially tried to hide it from ourselves and put it out of our minds so that we could believe what we wanted to believe, so that we could live the way we wanted to live and still feel good about it, you know, that we weren't going to have to answer for it. We were without excuse. Well, Paul went on in the second chapter to show us why the Jews also have no excuse. And by the way, think about this. The, the situation the Jews were in, having uh, the oracles of God, the Word of God, is pretty much the same situation we were in if we were raised in a Christian household with the Bible, okay? Um, they were still without excuse because having this revelation, having God's clearer, you know, uh, well, revelation of His law, they still didn't obey Him. I'm afraid it was the same problem that we had. Paul said it didn't matter that the Jews had His law. It didn't matter that we had the Bible. It didn't matter that they had His mark of circumcision or that we are baptized. What really matters is whether or not they or we actually obey Him. Remember chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul says this, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, I didn't, I didn't make this remark. Paul here is not saying that we are saved by our works, but what he is saying is that in the end, he's really referring to what James is talking about. In the end, those who were going to be accepted by God, justified in the end that they had true saving faith, are not just those who had, it, had the law of God and who heard it, who even agreed with it, thought it was a good thing, but actually those who do it. And we can only do it, Paul is arguing in Romans, through the new birth, that comes only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that is what makes all the difference. Now, having shown us why the Jews are guilty, this morning Paul goes on to answer several objections they might raise. And then he shows us why God gave His law in the first place. And that is not to justify us, but to drive us to the only one who can, to drive us to Christ. That's a simple message, even though Paul words it in a very complicated way. Now, first of all, Paul begins by answering objections that the Jews not only might have raised, but I think they actually did. I mean, Paul didn't waste words. To excuse themselves. Again, we're God's chosen. We are His people. We're going to be safe. We are safe. We'll, we'll be saved. But no, Paul is arguing you're, you're no safer than the Gentile. Okay? So having said that, their first reaction is this. If we are truly no better than the Gentiles, if we're just as guilty, perhaps more so because we actually have God's Word, then what advantage is there to being a Jew? What is the advantage of having the law and circumcision? Notice Paul says, first of all, great in every way. Okay, you are, you are a blessed people. Now, the most important blessing is God gave you His Word. That is, you were entrusted with the oracles of God. You were the only people in the entire world blessed to be in a relationship with Him and to have His revelation so that you would know how to be accepted, how to be justified by Him. We noted last week that while the world was in absolute darkness, there was light only in Israel. But of course, for that light to do them any good, they did have to believe they did have to trust in the one who was coming. The fact that they had the oracles of God, the, the Scripture, uh, simply made them more accountable if they did not trust in Him. And as a matter of fact, that's what happened. Where there is great privilege, there is also great responsibility. And again, as I think about that, remember that our children, 
that we raised in the Bible, in the church, had these same privileges. As a matter of fact, many of us also had them raised in Christian households. They have been blessed. They know the will of God. They know the gospel. And that makes them really even more accountable. Okay? So let's continue to pray that the Lord might yet have mercy upon them. Great blessings, again, can lead to greater judgment if they don't actually receive the one that these, again, the Scriptures speak of. Now, Paul continues with, with their next objection. If some of us didn't believe, does that mean that God didn't keep His promise to save His people? It does appear in the Old Testament that God does make a rather, you know, it seems like almost a universal uh, promise that He's going to save His people at times. Paul denies that that's even a possibility, that God would ever go back on His Word, and He does it in the strongest possible way in the Greek. He's, and it's translated into our English, may it never be. I think in, in the King James it says, God forbid. And essentially it means, may it never even come into our thoughts or into existence. It's impossible. Even if every man in the world lies, everyone, God will always be true to His Word. Now, by the way, doesn't this argumentation sound familiar? God promised that He's going to save His people. And yet, many of us didn't believe. Does that mean that God's promises to Israel have failed? No, Paul is going to argue in chapters 9 through 11 in some detail that his promise to Israel did not fail because they are not all Israel who are of Israel. God never promised to save all of Abraham's children according to the flesh, that is, his physical offspring. But he did promise to save the children of the promise, those who believe like Abraham, because those are the true children of Abraham, those who believe. And again, what this means is he's promised to save us. If we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we too are like Isaac, children of promise. We are the true children of Abraham. Now he continues, but wouldn't it be unjust for God, again from the Jewish perspective, wouldn't it be unjust for God to punish us? If, in verses 5 and 6, if our unrighteousness demonstrates His righteousness. Now again, here's another one of those things we have to untangle. What he means is, if by our sinning, we give God the opportunity to bring something good out of that, doesn't that mean that it would be unjust for God to punish us because He works it together for good? Now, just saying this makes Paul want to distance himself. This isn't what I'm thinking. This is what I'm saying. I'm speaking in human terms. I'm reflecting what I hear others saying. Actually, he says what they're saying about him. Again, he denies this, may it never be. Again, using the strongest possible denial. He says if that were true. If, if God couldn't judge anyone because he uses their sins to bring about good, then how could God possibly judge the world? I mean, everybody on the Day of Judgment would be able to say, well, well, God, I have an excuse. You took this sin, this wickedness that I did, and you worked it together for good, so you shouldn't judge me for that. Well, the next objection really amounts to the same thing, where he says, if I lie, and God uses my lie to show the glory of His truth, how could He judge me for that? Now, I think what Paul is doing here is, and again, it may seem somewhat strange, but this, this is what they're arguing, okay? And Paul says this is exactly what the Jews were accusing him of teaching through his doctrine in verse 8. Why not say, as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come? Since God works good out of our evil, Let's do more evil. Paul has only one response to this. Their condemnation is just. If you're going to reason this way, you deserve to fall under the judgment of God. We are never allowed to do evil under the pretense that it's good 
because God is going to work good out of it. Now, I, ho I hope this sounds somewhat familiar because I think it may have been last week or the week before we noted when Dr. Gerstner, John Gerstner, remember R.C. Sproul's mentor, when he asked the question, why is there evil? Why does God allow evil in the world? His answer was this, because it's good that there is evil. And you see, this, this is what's going on here. The Jews are saying, well, God's working good out of it. It's, it's good that there's evil. God allows our evil because of the good that he's going to work through it. I mean, again, the classic examples we were looking at, I think it was on Wednesday, wasn't it? The classic example of, uh, well, wasn't it good that Joseph's brothers sold him as a slave into Egypt because God delivered them through that, raised up Joseph a second to Pharaoh and saved them through the famine? God worked good out of it. Does that mean what the brothers did is excusable? No. Well, God also worked the greatest blessing we, have ever, we ever will be able to experience. He saved us through the greatest crime that was ever committed, the crucifixion of his son. Does that mean that the Jews who hated him turned him over to the Romans for his, for, to put him to death, that they're excused for doing that? No. What, what is 70 AD all about, right? God's judgment on the Jews for the rejection of his son, the, the crime of putting him to death. God does work good out of our evil, but this is never an excuse for us to sin. When we sin, God is still going to hold us accountable for it. By the way, Paul's going to address that in Romans chapter 6. Shall we, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Well, then what is the main point of all this? His next question actually draws all of this to a conclusion. Are we Jews better than the Gentiles because of our advantages. Because that's what the Jews wanted to argue. It's what the Pharisees argued. It's why they pulled their skirts in every time they passed by a, a Gentile. We're, we're holy. We're, we're God's chosen. We're, we're the holy ones. We have His law. We know His will. But Paul's answer would crush that. Not at all. We're not better than them at all. We've all broken the law. We are all guilty just as they also are. The Gentiles have broken the law that is written on their hearts, but we have broken the law written on stone. Paul then points out that this is what the Scripture, the, the, the writings as it is written, this, this is what Scripture says. And these quotes that we're so familiar with, because this is where we always go to for the doctrine of total depravity, this comes from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, from the Proverbs, and also some passages from Isaiah. 10, verses 10 through 18, Paul says this, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. Poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Are we any better than they? No, because this is a commentary on what each of us are like as we come into the world. Can we, Jews, earn our own righteousness through our own works? Scripture says there is none righteous, not even one. Can we do anything acceptable to God apart from His grace? There is none who does good. There is not even one. Is anyone genuinely seeking God in a way that pleases Him? There is none who seeks for God. All have turned out of the way. As we come into the world apart from God's grace, and this applies to everyone, every area of our being is so affected by sin that we are completely unable to do anything pleasing to God. We cannot make ourselves acceptable to God. We cannot work our way into His graces. We cannot even receive the grace that He offers us through the gospel because we hate Him. Now, that is really what the law shows us, that that is the purpose of the law, and that's where we move on to the rest of the chapter. 
If God didn't give the law so that we could work our way into his good graces, why did God give it to us in the first place? Well, that's what Paul goes on now to answer. He writes in verses 19 through 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. And I think here he's talking about not just the Ten Commandments, but also the Ten Commandments written on the heart, uh, in, you know, in the conscience of the Gentile, because it, it refers to everyone. Whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. That's not the reason why God gave it. Why did he give it? For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God did not give his law to the Jews on Mount Sinai or to the Gentiles in their hearts so that by keeping it, they might justify themselves. He gave it to us to show us that we would never be good enough on our own so that it would force us to turn to the only one who could ever give to us the righteousness that we needed to be acceptable to God. Paul writes in verses 21 through 22, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, it has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. He tells us that the righteousness of God, and by the way, he means by this not the righteousness by which God is righteous. God doesn't give to us his personal righteousness. But the righteousness that he gives that makes us acceptable to him, that righteousness that Jesus earned for us, the righteousness he gives us through his death on the cross, that that has been revealed apart from the law, apart from our obedience to the commandments. He says the law and the prophets, they bear witness to it. God promised in the Old Testament scriptures that he would give it freely to all who believe, whether to Jew or to Greek. He says, because in verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all, Jews and Gentiles, we have all failed to reach his standard. We all need his grace. There is no distinction between us. We've all sinned, and we will all be justified in only one way, and that is through the righteousness that he has provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that Paul says that this has always been the case. Remember the hymn we sang at the beginning, not all the blood of beasts and so forth, and what David said, it's not sacrifice and offering you desire, but a broken and contrite heart. This has always been the case. Now, I believe Paul, when, when he says that God publicly portrayed Jesus as crucified, he made this satisfaction to his justice so that he might be just even though he passed over the sins that were previously committed. I think he's referring to what he was doing in the Old Covenant under these sacrifices. In the Old Covenant, it did appear as though God was forgiving sin on the basis of the animal sacrifice because he commanded them to bring a particular animal and they were to confess their sins. The priest were, was to, you know, to, to kill and slaughter that animal and sacrifice it on behalf of the, the individual and then the priest was to declare the individual forgiven. And yet the author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10 verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So how do we reconcile this? Well, the reason they were forgiven, the reason why God passed over their sins is because of what Jesus would do in the future on the cross. And we believe that when the old covenant saints looked forward through these sacrifices, by faith to the payment that God was going to provide in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were actually forgiven. Now, not all of them did this, okay? They didn't all do this. But those who were regenerated again by God's grace, by the Holy Spirit, did see the fulfillment of the promise through the types and the shadows, through the promises and through the animal sacrifices. Now, Paul tells us that God made sure that Jesus was crucified publicly, 
not only that we would see that God has provided a propitiation, and again, that's a fancy word which means a sacrifice or a payment that has satisfied His justice for our sins. Not only that we might see it, we Gentiles, but that the Jews might know that God was just in forgiving the sins He said were forgiven, which actually were through Christ when those sacrifices were made in the Old Covenant. Okay, God was just even then. We, we often talk about it this way, that the merits of Christ's cross, His crucifixion, go both directions. You know, uh, this, this is future from your perspective. It, it goes to the past, right? It flows back to the past, all the way back to Adam and Eve, who trusted in the, the, the seed that God promised was coming, who would crush the head of the serpent. And then when He made the animal sacrifices and clothed their nakedness, giving them a picture of His Son who was going to come <clears throat> and the sacrifice He was going to make, but the benefits of the cross also flow to the, to the future, don't they? That's the reason why we can still benefit today. But God had Jesus publicly crucified to show all of us, to show the world that He is just in the forgiving of sins because God cannot forgive sins unless a payment is made. But that payment was made, not through the animal sacrifices, but through the sacrifice of His Son, and it is enough to satisfy His justice. It is the only sacrifice that God will accept. So what, what has Paul done in chapter 3? What he's done is he's completely pulled the rug out from under the Jews who thought they were justified by, again, having the law through circumcision, through keeping the law. He's actually taken away the grounds for anyone, any one of us, to pat ourselves on the back for any supposed contribution that we make to our acceptance with God, to our justification. And again, that's why Top Lady writes in the hymn that we sang earlier, the glory, Lord, from first to last is due to you alone, ought to ourselves, that means anything at all, to ourselves we dare not take or rob you of your crown. All the glory goes to God. In the way that He has done it, He gets all the praise. He gets all the credit, and we get absolutely none. The only thing we bring to the equation is our sin. But the Lord takes it away and gives to us the righteousness of Christ because of His great grace and mercy. Now, Paul continues. He has one last point that, that he wants to make. Well, actually, a couple here. Okay, Paul continues. Since salvation doesn't come through the law, this implies in verse 29 that he intends to give it to all men, Jews and Gentiles, without distinction. That there's only one way for both. He says, God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through faith. And again, what he means by that is not... And by the way, that, that, that change of, of preposition really makes no substantial difference. Everyone is saved by faith. And that doesn't mean God looking at our faith as an act of righteousness justifies us on the basis of the righteousness of, of that act of faith. But what it means is looking to Jesus Christ and receiving His righteousness. That is how He will justify Jews and Gentiles. Justification is by God's grace alone. It's received by faith alone. Remember, this is the great Reformation principle. Okay, this is the heart of the gospel. The article on which the church stands or falls. This is the message of the Bible. Okay? And that's why, again, we have to remind ourselves of it because we so often fall into this other way of thinking. It's by His grace alone. He gets all the glory alone. Now, finally, the last point. Paul asked the very practical question. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Basically, do we abolish it? Do we get rid of it? Does, it? does it really have no practical use? Since we're not justified by keeping it, is it irrelevant? Now, his answer may surprise some modern-day antinomians. Antinomians are people who are basically against the law, and they say, we don't need the law. We don't need to keep the law. Jesus has done it all. I just need to pray a prayer. I'm on my way to heaven. doesn't matter how I live after that. No, that, that's not true. Paul 
uses the strongest language again to deny this. May it never be. No, the law still has plenty of good uses. As a matter of fact, two we want to focus on. The law God gave us, remember the law, to drive us to Christ. And that's why we need it. Every time we read the law of God and we see what God requires of us, it should drive us again to Christ because we cannot keep this law. This is what God gives to us to tell others about their need of Christ. Why do they need Him? Well, show them the law. They're not good enough. It drives them to Christ. That's the reason why John the Baptist, remember, came preaching repentance before Jesus came to prepare the people of Israel to receive the Messiah. Because John was saying, you're not good enough. You need the one who's coming after me. And that's, again, why we still need the law. It's not nullified. It's established. But there's another sense in which the law is not irrelevant that Paul's going to bring up again and again. Having been justified by faith does not release us from our obligation to keep the law. Because remember, the law shows us how to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Shows us how to love God, how to love our neighbor. And that is God's will. That's the reason why he sent Jesus into the world to obey that law so he could give us a perfect righteousness. And that's why Jesus sent his spirit into the world to change our hearts so that we would live this way. Yes, the law is still very applicable to our situation today. It, it is the blueprint for our sanctification. It's what God is after. Remember what he said in chapter 2, it's not those who hear the law who are just, but those who actually do it. And remember what James says in James chapter 2, he goes, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Living faith produces works. What kind of works? Well, works that are according to the law of God. Paul is going to go on to argue in the book of Romans that having been set free from sin, we have now become the slaves of righteousness. But righteousness is defined by the law of God. So the law of God is just as important for us now as it was before we came to Christ because it teaches us how to live a righteous life. It teaches us how to live for God's glory. Faith does not nullify the law it establishes the law. The law basically does what it was meant to do. It's just that the Jews misunderstood that. It has a perfectly good purpose, drives us to Christ, as, as I think it was Stott who said, although I wouldn't recommend everything Stott says. But he did say the law drives us to Christ to be justified, and Jesus points us back to the law to be sanctified. We need to keep those two things straight. If we do, we have the true gospel. So as we prepare to come to the table this morning, we really should ask ourselves this question, you know, are we the slaves of righteousness? Has this transformation taken place in our lives? Are we still like the Jews, slavishly trying to earn our, our own righteousness to make God accept us through the good things we do? Or are we trusting in Jesus alone and we show that we are? from the fact that we love the law of God, we love Him, and we are doing these things in order to please Him. If that is the case, God calls us to come to the table in order to nurture that faith that we might be strengthened in grace so that we would, again, obey Him more. God is interested in obedience. We need to remember that. He wants us to obey Him. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us as we come to the table to receive the help that He has for us here in order to do that.